um, adventure, exploration, and so many of the things that we have been been missing over the last couple of months, uh, and a real inspiration as to what could happen when we get back to the fabulous world of adventure and exploration. Um, SES have very kindly agreed for me to now stream the uh, the whole event here on YouTube, on Twitter, and on Facebook as well. So if you didn't get to see it, then um, you can just plug in now to my live. Obviously, it's, it's completely free. You don't need any tickets or anything. And I am going to sit here with Helen and watch and do, do my best to answer any questions. So anything that you've got you'd like to ask, just type into the, uh, the question bar, and I'll do my very, very best to try and answer them. But now, without further ado, uh, I'm going to hand you over to our host and to the Scientific Exploration Awards. <laughs> From Bristol. I am Liv Grant, I am a conservationist and filmmaker, and I am delighted and so honoured to have been asked to introduce this year's Scientific Exploration Society Explorer Awards. We have an exciting evening ahead full of inspiration and an amazing range of speakers and a film screening. For those of you who are new to the Scientific Exploration Society, the SES, it was founded in 1969 by Colonel John Blashford Snell, CBE, and is the longest running charitable scientific exploration organization in the world. Through its annual Explorer Awards, the SES gives six grants to pioneers with purpose and scientific trailblazers, leading expeditions that focus on discovery, research and conservation in remote parts of the world. The explorers have to be prepared to take on monumental physical, logistical and global challenges, and share the values of grit, curiosity and integrity and leadership that pioneers like John Blashford Snell exemplify. I would like to welcome sponsors, friends and guests from around the world for this, the seventh Explorer Awards presentation evening and our very first live stream event. COVID-19 has forced us all to think creatively, to work in a different way and embrace the technologies available to us. So the plan this evening is to welcome and introduce you to six outstanding individuals as they receive their 2020 Explorer Awards. We will also celebrate the phenomenal achievements of three inspirational individuals, whom the S Honorary Award winners. Joining us as guest presenters, we have Mark Beaumont, Tim Peake and Levison Wood, and we will finish the evening with a talk by our keynote speaker, Steve Backshall. Stay with us till the end. Before we move on to the presentations, here is a message from the SES chairman. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the annual SES, the Oscars of Exploration, where we honor our pioneers with purpose. First of all, I'd like to congratulate all of our awardees tonight, not only our famous explorer honorary champions, but also the young explorers winning financial grants for the first time and for their work and brilliant scientific projects around the globe. I'm only sorry that we're recognising and celebrating your success tonight in isolation. It's such a shame. But that we're broadcasting in life and it's down to the efforts and skills of a few key people I'd like to thank now. Liv Grant, thank you so much for hosting tonight's event. To Reza Pakravan for your wonderful tech wizardry in enabling this to be live streamed. To Henrietta and Nikki, our directors, and of course not forgetting the hours of work put in by the SES Awards Committee in the preceding months. If I may, I'd like to offer a virtual round of applause. Thank you to our event sponsors, RSK and Craig Cohorn. And of course, recognise again the generosity of the individuals and businesses that for our scientific projects. Finally, in these uncertain times, let the show begin. Thank you, Neil. So great to hear from the chairman of the SES. Now, I am delighted to start this evening by introducing the Sir Charles Bloyce Explorer Award for Science and Adventure, supported by Sir Charles Bloyce. This award was created to support a scientific adventurer and trailblazer, undertaking an adventurous expedition with strong physical requirements in a challenging environment, aiming to produce new scientific, 
physical or anthropological insight into little-known communities. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this year's winner, Emma Miller, for her well-being and resilience. Emma is talking to us from Nepal. Hi Liv, thank you and namaste from Kathmandu. I want to extend my deepest and sincere gratitude and joy to the SES and Sir Charles for this great honour. Thank you also to the SES for your adaptability and creativity putting this event together. My intention with wellbeing exploration is to engender empathy, common humanity and connection. And as a wellbeing specialist, the last number of weeks I've been working with people from all over the world to prioritize their wellbeing and connect during this time. So it's more important than ever that we have events like this to bring people together. After having explored the passions and missions of my fellow pioneers with purpose, it is meaningful that we have the space to honor and celebrate the impact of our research and expeditions. Our expedition traverses the Great Himalaya Trail in Nepal. We'll trek 1,700 kilometers over several months to learn and explore the perceptions of well being and strategies of mental resiliency of the remote mountainous communities that are on the front lines of climate change. Now is an unprecedented, difficult, and for many, a tragic time, but perhaps it's also an opportunity to explore resiliency interconnectedness and well-being on a global scale. We hope that our research contributes to the complex and vital exploration of well-being in Nepal. Thank you again for your support. Over to you, Liv. Thank you, Emma. So great that you could join us all the way from Nepal. Knowledge is three exceptional individuals who have impressed and inspired in the world of science, exploration and adventure, and who are chosen to be SES Honorary Award winners. This year's Pioneer with Purpose winner will be announced by Mark Beaumont. Mark won an SES Honorary Award in 2018 for his incredible achievement of cycling around the world in 78 days. And we are delighted that he is able to join us from Scotland to present the first Honorary Award. Mark, over to you. Thank you very much, Liv, and uh, great to be joining you remotely. Very strange to not be at another fantastic live event with SES in London, celebrating all things exploration and science and global travel. Um, certainly my own uh, global journeys have been curtailed for now, and I've actually been enjoying exploring close to home, going for a daily run, my six-year-old daughter and her bicycle with me, and it's amazing what you can find within a mile of where you live. Um, now on to this, uh, this year's award, the SES Pioneer with a Purpose Honorary Award. And the winner is John Volenthen, who is a world record holding British cave diver. He's been at the forefront of underground rescue and exploration over the last two decades. John began caving with the Scouts when he was 14 years old and continues to push the limits of underwater cave exploration to this day. In 2018, he played a key role in the Thailand cave rescue and was awarded the George Medal by the Queen for showing great courage. Using his background in medical electronics, John has built breathing equipment used to explore caves worldwide and designed and produced cave mapping technologies. John lives in Bristol and spends his spare time running ultra marathons. I'm delighted to introduce to you the SES Pioneer with a Purpose Award winner, John Volenthen. Thank you, Mark and SES. I'm honoured to be recognised with this year's Pioneer with Purpose Award. This type of thing's fairly new to me. Until very recently, people were generally advised not to copy the things that I do. I would have liked to have been with you in person, but current circumstances mean that I'm in Bristol at home, like many watching the weather from inside my windows. Underground exploration has always played an important part in my life and I've continuously sought to expand my horizons, visit new places and bring back knowledge, both of underwater caves and the techniques we use to visit them. The single most important factor for me, however, is mindset. I was really lucky to be introduced to adventure in the Scouts at a very young age and I recall one particular caving trip under the Somerset Hills 
where I changed the way I looked at challenges forever. Instead of asking why do something, I suddenly started asking why not. Developing positive attitudes is so key and organisations and initiatives like SES and Rally International are more crucial than ever. It's never been more important to engage young people, opening the door to the joys and sometimes hardships of adventure, providing a crucible to develop the skills they need when life takes unexpected twists and turns, as indeed it has done for many very recently. The caving and cave diving community is small and it's one I feel a tremendous responsibility towards. It's unquestionably teamwork and that can-do attitude that allows us to succeed in exploration and occasionally the rescues we're called to perform. Adventure or exploration rarely unfold the way you plan. Experiencing that uncertainty can be unsettling and sometimes downright frightening. At the moment across the globe, the situation is more uncertain than ever, with many facing hardships that just a few weeks ago seemed unthinkable. I believe adventure leaves us much better prepared, not just to survive difficult times, but to thrive and have the spare capacity to offer something positive in return. Back to you, Liv, in the studio. Thank you so much, John, for joining us in these challenging times. Tim Peake is a British Army Air Corps officer, European Space Agency astronaut, and a former International Space Station crew member who joined the SES's Honorary Advisory Board. is extremely grateful to him for his support and for joining us tonight to present the Honorary Award. It is my great pleasure to introduce the first British astronaut to spacewalk, Tim Peake. Are you there, Tim? Okay, great. Hi Liv, it's great to be joining you and uh, despite the lockdown, I'm really delighted that we can still overcome these challenges with technology and we're able to go ahead with such a a worthwhile award ceremony. Now, adventurer Steve Backshaw has travelled extensively around the globe. During his adventures, he scaled some of the world's most challenging mountains and terrains, experienced tribal rituals in Indonesia, faced riots in East Timor, got a black belt in martial arts and come face to face with the most deadly creatures on earth. He's one of the busiest presenters on television with award-winning shows across the BBC, UK TV, ITV, Channel 5, Discovery, and National Geographic channels. His most recent 10-part series, Expedition, saw him travel to some of the most remote areas of our planets. Steve is particularly well-known to younger audiences for his Deadly 60 series on CBBC. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce the Explorer of the Year, Steve Backshaw. Wow, well, that is quite an accolade. And to have it coming from you, Tim, arguably our greatest living explorer, uh, is even more of a privilege. Incidentally, to everyone else, Tim told me beforehand to say that. (laughs) (laughs) It's something that makes me incredibly proud to be uh, receiving an award like this, and certainly not something I could have thought about when I was a kid living in the most humble, ordinary family life you can imagine, expeditions, because apart from anything else, I didn't think they were possible. I thought that was something that had happened to people in a different generation and a different time. But what the last few years of going out on old-fashioned exploration trips has told me is is that there's still so much left to do. There's still, you know, at least a couple of generations worth of old family heading to the stars, like dark cave system millions of years there are still whitewater rivers in the Himalayas and jungle rivers uh, in South America where nobody has been before and the opportunity to see those with fresh eyes now in in this century it completely blows my mind Um, it's been a great privilege for me but I guess here in the first place which was with scouting so I learned so many of the skills that I use traditions in scouting I, I know that Tim you are also an ambassador for the scouts and you know believe in its message as, as much as I do to any youngsters out there who are thinking that this could be a part of your life or your future please get started with something like scouting because and a massive massive thank you to you Tim for giving me this award but also to the Scientific Exploration Society for all the work you do uh, and for this incredible honour. Now uh, back to you Liv in the studio. Thank you Steve. You'll be thrilled to know that Steve is not only with us to receive his award but he is also tonight's keynote speaker. 
It gives me great pleasure to introduce the Goff Explorer Award for Medical Aid and Research, supported by Viscount Goff. This award has been created to support an individual leading an expedition to either carry out medical aid or associated research within communities in developing regions of the world. This year's Goff Explorer is Allegra Alley for the 2020 Passage Expedition. Allegra is talking to us from Israel. Can you hear me there, Allegra? Yes, I can hear you perfectly well. Thank you, Liv. Great. Thanks, Allegra. Hi everyone. So um, I'm currently bouncing homes between Australia and Israel with my husband and my two years old son Noah. I'm the founder of a nonprofit organization called Adventurous Midwives, an ethnographer, photographer, and also a member of the Flag and Honors Committee at the Explorers Club. Since 2011, I've been conducting solo expeditions into remote indigenous communities across the world, from the frozen tundra of Siberia to the jungles of Papua New Guinea to search and document the most important stages in a woman's life, from birth to rite of passage rituals, marriages, and motherhood. Thank you so much to the Scientific Exploration Society and to Lord Goff Bowell. I'm extremely honored and humbled to be the recipient of the 2020 Goff Explorer Award for Medical Aid and Research. The 2020 Passage is a groundbreaking exploratory expedition to the remote and rarely visited Bosavi area of Papua New Guinea. The expedition's objectives will champion the guiding purpose of the Gulf Explorer Award by creating foundation between contemporary midwives and indigenous midwives, and by doing so to support the health and survival of babies. My visit, the more passionate I become about advocating for the protection of their traditional knowledge and birth and rights, and which I believe are crucial to the human legacy of knowledge. Indigenous midwives have an incredible wealth of knowledge about plant medicine, traditional practices, and sacred rituals that not only help with childbirth, but contribute to the whole community's health and spiritual well-being. Thank you so much, and back to you leaving the studio. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Allegra. Good luck on your future expedition, and stay safe. The Neville Shulman Explorer Award for Expedition Filmmaking is supported by Neville Shulman CBE. The winner has to be an individual with filmmaking experience organising a scientific or geographical expedition who is required to, short, to produce a short film to communicate the expedition's results to a wider audience. Before we announce our 2020 winner, we are going to screen the 2019 Neville Shulman Explorer Reza Pakravan's film The Great Green Hope which Neville has kindly offered to introduce. Thank you so much for your introduction. It's always good to be with you all at the Scientific Exploration Society. It's such a great honor for me to be part of the SES. I'm very proud indeed to present the winner of last year's award, a filmmaker extraordinaire, I would say, <laughs> because Reza has dedicated himself over the last year to making a film of importance and spending a great deal of time and resources in order to try to create a film which I think you will find very important, very impressive. Continue the message that Razor believes in so much. He was very concerned about the climatic changes taking place in the Sahara region, wanted to record them, wanted to speak to the locals and tried to find out if there were ways of going forward and it wasn't all a disaster and it isn't all a disaster because uh, Reza has called his film The Great Green Hope and that's what we're looking forward to hearing about today. So Reza, over to you and The Great Green Hope. Thank you Neville for the introduction and your introduction process. The Great Green Hope, indeed. I spent the last two years traveling through the Sahelian countries. These forgotten frontiers are marked by war, insurgency, and climate shocks. And in the midst of darkness, I found a beam of light. And that was the Great Green Hope. Enjoy. <laughs> The 
The Sahelian belt in North Africa is where climate change has hit the hardest. A wounded frontier, which holds stories of men and women struggling to survive in one of the harshest environments on the planet. Sign of the global warming crisis, and it has contributed to the greatest human migration. Here, the encroaching desert has fueled the cycle of poverty and provided a breeding ground for the terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram. At the end of one world and the beginning of another is a land of encounters known as the Sahel. In recent years, climate change and desertification have severely degraded the land here. Temperatures are rising faster than anywhere else on Earth and families struggle to overcome the threshold of war, terrorism and the slow dissolution of their traditional nomadic lives. Here, survival is a talent and an exercise anchored to life. But people have never lost hope. I've come to northern Senegal, where the Sahel has started to come back to life again. Resilience has manifested itself in the Great Green Wall, an emerging wonder changing lives on the African continent. A dream to grow a wall of trees and plants across the entire width of Africa to bring life back to the Sahel and provide a solution to the migrant crisis. My name is Reza Pakravan. I'm a writer and filmmaker. I travel to remote parts documenting the experiences of indigenous people whose lives have been impacted by environmental issues. The Great Green Wall started as an ambitious plan of planting a wall of trees across the continent. But in recent years, the plan has evolved and land management has become an integral part of the project, aiming to restore degraded land in the region. The importance of the Grande Mirage is not only to plant for plant, no. But also, it's to create the conditions of life, that means the biodiversity. There are also problems of mortality, you see. This tree is already dead, you see. Avec le repos du sol et aussi l'impact de la culture, on peut pouvoir avoir... C'est le capital de ces populations dans cette zone, c'est surtout la terre. Aujourd'hui, la dégradation de ces terres, qui est amenée par cette désertification, fait que ces populations ne parviennent pas à avoir des activités telles que l'agriculture, l'élevage, euh, l'arboriculture. Et qui dit pauvreté dans une zone, ça veut dire que les gens vont se déplacer. Donc cela va amener la migration. Les populations vont se déplacer, aller voir ailleurs où vraiment ils peuvent, ils puissent survivre. So has the plantation impacted the quality of the soil? Aujourd'hui, avec cette plantation, vous voyez que Les arbres sont en train de fixer le sol et, et ils jouent un rôle très important dans l'érosion éolienne et l'érosion hydrique. La grande muraille verte n'est pas un mur. Ce n'est pas un mur d'arbres. C'est en fait une mosaïque d'activités. On a constaté que beaucoup d'espèces ont, ont disparu. Donc maintenant, Au fur et à mesure qu'on installe, qu'on qu fait des plantations, il y a le retour de certaines espèces. Notre activité, c'est de faire revenir la végétation. Le rôle que nous avons est de faire en sorte que ces populations qui vivent maintenant dans la pauvreté, qu'on puisse leur donner des revenus, euh, des activités qui leur permettent de rester vivre dans ces zones-là. Since starting the plantation and the introduction of land management in 2010, the soil has improved significantly. People can now grow fruit and vegetables and feed their livestock. 
Those previously forced to find new pastures or migrate to cities are now staying. The Great Green Wall has not only restored the degraded land, but has also created jobs and food security. Climate change in the Sahel is not an abstraction, is a part of everyday life. At the center of the continent is Lake Chad, which in recent decades has shrunk by 90%. As the desert encroaches ever further, families find it increasingly difficult to find a living out of fishing and farming. Currently, over 10 million people are reliant upon aid, one of the biggest humanitarian catastrophes on Earth. Boko Haram have taken advantage of the cycle of poverty, recruiting people with the promise of money and food. They burned villages and killed those who resisted. Actually, they forced you to walk for one month. Did they put a gun to your head? Nigeria and how was life like under Boko Haram? So, let me get this right. They attack your village and threaten everyone to join them. And you left your husband and you joined Boko Haram? Yeah, I Oh, I'm really sorry. So your your husband actually died while you were in captivity. Yeah, with other words, it's so brutal. You know, they capture you and taking you away from your family. What happened to your children? In West Africa, up to 80% of the population live in rural areas. Struggling families move away from their homes in search of new fertile land. Youth unemployment is an enormous problem across the Sahel and a massive driver of migration. But those in search of a better life in Europe also fuel human trafficking in Niger. Niger has become the principal hub for illegal migrants journeying to Libya and on to Europe. At the center of it is the ancient city of Agadez, where the human smuggling trade is booming. For many, this is the starting point of a perilous journey across deserts and seas. This are 200 francs CFA. 200 francs CFA. How many euros is that? Uh, less, less than 50 cents euro. <laughs> and this is the life support mission. That's Basically, the, that's the safety belt. This, yeah, that's the life depending on this. Yeah. Three days. Three, three days on yeah. this. Yeah, three days. They go to Libya. All them, all them. <laughs> He's gonna look for work. Yeah. Eleven hours of driving. Yeah. No, no stop. No stop. Are you are you ready for tomorrow? Eleven hours in this position. Ready? Ready? Libya, huh? Libya. Libya. 
This is intense, really, really intense. How many people are in this truck? The Great Green Wall promises new opportunities to communities across the Sahel. Now, more and more countries across the region are joining to support this incredible initiative. The project promises to restore 100 million hectares of degraded land, offsetting 250 million tons of carbon and generating 10 million jobs. How this target is going to be achieved remains to be seen. Certainly, the success of the Great Green Wall depends upon its commercial viability. Local communities into it if they see its commercial benefits. Regardless, the Great Green Wall is the for the people of the Sahel. Congratulations so much to you, Reza. Now we turn to the award for 2020. As always, we've had a lot of uh, very excellent uh, applications and uh, submissions by will-be filmmakers, but the award is going to someone who is pretty impressive herself, a lady called Amy Hong. And Amy um, is a filmmaker and uh, a communicator and she, together with her project's partner, uh, Laurie Hedges, is going to Rwanda to uh, film the making on the initial steps of a new national park. And um, Amy will tell us more about the way she's going to record the initial steps of this great new national park, as well as recording, hopefully, the uh, local uh, key species and uh, the local communities so we know more about the, the regions where it's uh, being created. So Amy, I look forward to hearing more from you now on how you plan your expedition. Thank you indeed. My name is Amy and I'm very honoured here today to be receiving the Neville Schumann Exploration Award. First of all, I would like to thank my project partner, Laurie Hedges, my family and friends for supporting me throughout the journey. For my project, I will be working with the Rwanda Development Board to make a film about the Geshwati Mukura National Park. The Geshwati Mukura National Park is a newly established park in 2016, but previously it has suffered greatly from deforestation down to 1% of its formal size. So now the success of the park really depends on the buy-in of the local communities and with our film, we'll have the opportunity to use the film to attract eco-tourists which will generate income that benefits the local community. And during the expedition, we'll be taking local talents on to train them into Rwanda's future conservation filmmakers. So this project is not only a project that will document what conservation has been done in Rwanda and its great achievement, but also it will be an opportunity to give the voice back to the Rwandans and let them to tell their own conservation stories in the future. So I'm super, super excited about this project and I would like to thank Exploration, uh, Scientific Exploration Society so much for the opportunity. 
and I know my partner uh, Laurie Hedges is really excited about this opportunity too. So off to you, Laurie. Thank you, Amy. I just want to say how incredibly excited I am to be going back to Rwanda to work in this brand new national park, Gishwati Mukuru, and to working with the Rwandan Development Board on what I really believe is going to be a great project. Uh, so first and foremost, I just want to say the biggest of thanks to Amy. I want to thank the Scientific Exploration Society for believing in us, for believing in this project, and to our partners, the Rwandan Development Board, for going along with us on this project. And I'm just so excited to get going. Thank you, everyone. The next award is the Rivers Foundation Explorer Award for Health and Humanities, supported by the Rivers Foundation. I am extra excited to present this award as I was the recipient in 2018, and it gave me the most wonderful opportunity to go on an adventure to one of the most remote islands in the world. This award is for an individual leading an expedition combining adventure with humanitarian purpose, benefiting communities in developing regions of the world. The 2020 Rivers Foundation Explorer is Craig Nuttall for his Garwal Mountain Rescue Project. Craig is talking to us from Utah, USA. Over to you, Craig. Thank you, Liv, and hello, everybody. Uh, I'm sitting here in quarantine in Utah in the United States. Uh, they asked me to find a quiet place for this with six kids at home. I'm not sure that's even possible. Not a lot of social distancing going on here. Um, anyway, so I, I just want to, first of all, uh, say thank you to the Scientific Exploration Society and the Rivers Foundation for making the Garwal Mountain Rescue Project possible. I'm so humbled by the opportunity to be named the uh, 2020 Rivers Foundation Explorer. I want to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I'm a professor in the College of Nursing at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, in the United States. Um, I'm also a nurse practitioner with a background in emergency medicine. I love the mountains. I love everything about them. And I've spent most of my professional life um, studying mountain medicine. Um, over, this has taken me to some very remote and, uh, and beautiful places. This past year, I had the opportunity to travel to the Garwal Mountain Range in the Indian Himalayas. And while I was there, I saw thousands of Hindu pilgrims making their way to temples. I saw Alpinists um, preparing themselves to scale some of the most challenging peaks in the world. And I saw villagers struggling to make ends meet. What I didn't see were hospitals, clinics, and healthcare providers. Many of the people that travel to this region will need urgent access to medical care. Unfortunately, the closest hospital is several miles away, um, several hours of travel away over mountain passes and over washed out roads, sometimes not even possible. This experience had a profound effect on me. I knew I had to do something for the people of this region. I'm from the mountains too, and I feel a special connection to these people. And that's how the Garwal Mountain Rescue Project was born. So I'll be traveling back to the Garwal region to train healthcare providers in mountain medicine. Um, and once these providers are trained, they're going to staff hospitals and clinics throughout the Garwal region, providing much needed access to medical care. I believe that we all deserve to live healthy lives. And a huge part of that is access to healthcare. I'm hoping that this project in some small way will make a difference in the lives of the people living in this region of the world. I also wanna inspire each one of you I want to inspire you to use your talents, your time, your gifts to do some good in the world. And that's why I want to share this journey with each one of you. Again, I'd like to thank the Scientific Exploration Society and the Rivers Foundation for making this project possible. Thank you for your time and stay safe. Back to you, Liv. Thank you so much, Craig. Uh, so fantastic to hear from you all the way over in Utah and to hear about the purpose of your project, which really will help people in these remote regions. Good luck with the six kids at home. <laughs> Thank you. If anyone wants to adopt one, I'm, I'm putting them up for adoption here. Too. <laughs> I'll take two. Now, the next honorary award is the SES Lifetime Achievement Award. I am pleased to introduce you to photographer and best-selling author Levison Wood, who will announce this year's winner. Lev is best known for his TV documentaries, Walking the Nile, Walking the Himalayas, and the Americas. Over to you, Lev. You got us there? Thank you very much, Liv. Great. Um, and also a massive thank you to everybody at um, the Scientific Exploration Society for, uh, for hosting this in these difficult and uncertain times. I hope everybody back home is um, staying safe and staying sane. And hopefully all of this will um, be over and done with very soon. 
Um, so anyway, um, on to um, the the main the main event. Um, in 2019, Time magazine named the winner of this year's award one of the hundred most influential people in the world. What is an amazing accolade! So I'm very proud to announce that this year's SES Lifetime Achievement goes to Dr. Jane Goodall, DBE, founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and the United Nations Messenger of Peace. In July 1960, at the age of just 26, Jane travelled from England to what is now Tanzania and ventured into the little-known world of chimpanzees. Equipped with a notebook, some binoculars and a fascination for wildlife, Jane braved a realm of unknowns to give the world a remarkable window into humankind's closest living relatives. Through nearly 60 years of groundbreaking work, Dr Jane Goodall has not only shown us the urgent need to protect chimpanzees from extinction, she has also redefined species conservation to include the needs of local people and the environment. The Jane Goodall Institute has offices in more than 25 countries around the world and works to support the core programs, including Take or Take Care, Two Sanctuaries for Orphan Chimpanzees, and Roots and Shoots, Jane Goodall Institute's humanitarian and environmental program, empowering young people of all ages to become hands on and involved in projects for their community, um, for animals, and the environment. Today, she travels the world more than 300 days a year. What an amazing, amazing uh, commitment. Speaking about the threats facing chimpanzees and environmental crises, urging each of us to take uh, action on behalf of all living things and the planet that we share. It is an absolute honour to present this award and hand you over to Dr. Jane Goodall. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lev. This is truly a great honour, this wonderful medal from the Science Exploration Society. And I was, I was sort of thinking about, you know, a Lifetime Achievement Award. Well, maybe not everybody knows, but I actually began my scientific career when I was one and a half. According to my mother, she came into my room and she found I was very carefully watching a whole lot of earthworms that I'd taken into my bed. She said, Jane, it looked as though you were wondering, how do they walk without legs? And instead of being angry, she helped me put them back in the garden. Then probably some of you have heard the story of how I was given a job of helping collect hen's eggs when we were staying for a fortnight on a farm in the country. And apparently I was asking everyone, but where does the egg come out of the hen? I couldn't see a hole big enough. And nobody told me. So what I remember vividly is seeing this hen go into the hen house. And the first one flew away, frightened, and because I crawled after her. And then I went into an empty hen house. I waited for apparently four hours and the family called the police. And again, my mother didn't get angry. She sat down to hear the exciting story of just how a hen lays an egg. When I was growing up, there was no television. And I explored science in two ways. First, I spent hours and hours every free hour outside in the garden on the cliffs around our home in Bournemouth, which is where I'm speaking from today. And watching the birds, finding nests, going back day after day to watch the baby birds fledge and then fly away, watching the jumping spiders in the garden, watching the plants growing. And the second way I learned was from books. There was no TV back then, as I say. And so it was books. I was eight when I got Dr. Doolittle, the story of Dr. Doolittle, from the library. We couldn't afford new books. And war was raging anyway. And of course, I fell in love with this doctor who could speak animal language. Oh, how badly I wanted to speak animal language. And the first book I ever had, I loved it so much. My grandmother saved up and got me a copy. I still have it today. And then when I was 10, I saved up enough pocket money to buy this little second-hand book. I have that too. Uh, Tarzan of the Apes. 
I hadn't heard about Tarzan, but of course I fell madly in love with this glorious lord of the jungle, was very jealous when he married the wrong Jane. So that led to my dream. I will grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. And eventually I saved up enough money. I didn't go to university, we couldn't afford it. But I saved up money when I was invited to Kenya by a school friend and I joined her and while I was there I was lucky enough to hear about Dr. Lewis Leakey and he's the one who gave me my chance. He said afterwards that he chose me because he wanted a mind uncluttered by the reductionist thinking of animal behaviorists at the time and because I was a woman and he felt that woman, women just might have more patience. And he asked me if I'd go and live with and learn from not just any animal, but the one most like us. So back in 1960, 60 years ago, I began this research on the chimpanzees. But how did I do it? Finally, he got a grant, six months money, a very small one, from an American philanthropist. And if I hadn't had that small grant, that study would never have happened. Afterwards, the National Geographic Society came in when I'd seen tool using. But that small grant, I want to say to you that what you're doing in your society, providing small grants to people in faraway places exploring, it makes all the difference in the world. So I'm really honored uh, to receive this, this medal from you. I shall treasure it. It means a lot. And now, back to the studio. Thank you, Jane, and keep safe. The Elodie Sandford Explorer Award for Amateur Photography is an award created by family and friends in memory of Elodie Sandford. I am delighted to introduce you to Paul Sandford, who will tell you more about this award and announce the winner. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Liv, and a special hello to all of you, wherever you are. I'm here in the beautiful city of Bath. Uh, what a night of great celebration and what a great uh, exhibition, I suppose, of what can be done when you embrace the uh, pioneering with purpose as the SES has done tonight. So before announcing the winner of this year's award, I think it's important, especially during difficult times like these, to take a moment to give thanks for those that have helped. As a donor myself, I'd first like to join with everybody else in thanking the SES, especially Nikki and the members of the assessment panel. Thanks for all the hours that you've put in to the selection process on our behalf. I'd also like to add my thanks to Reza and all those that supported him for finding a way of actually celebrating at all this evening, given that so many other events have simply been canceled. And finally, I'd like to thank my sister, and a small group of very close friends and family who have supported our award from the very beginning and helped to keep the memory of my mother very much alive. And what a cracking recipient that we had application, I knew that we had something special. We have a charismatic young pioneer, we have an exotic and remote destination, we have tropical jungle, we have the search for a rare and endangered species that needs our help, and it uses photography as the essential bit of research. It simply has it all for us. And I promise you that if my mother was here tonight and heard about it, she would have sent him herself. So let me end by wishing you all a very good evening and by introducing you to the 2020 Elodi Sanford Explorer Award for Amateur Photography to Mr. Toby Nolan. Hi there, Paul. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. My name's Toby. I'm calling from Bristol and uh, Bristol in the UK, and I am the LED Sanford Explorer 2020. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to receive the award. Thank you so much to the whole Sanford family and to the SES for enabling me to go ahead with an expedition I've dreamed of doing for a long, long time. Uh, and it's 
to go in search of the critically endangered Javan rhinoceros, um, which is the rarest large land mammal on the planet. Only 72 individuals remain, and it lives only in Ujung Kulon, uh, the far western corner of Java in Indonesia. Um, it's an expedition I wanted to do since I saw the first colour photograph of the species uh, when I was 11 years old. I remember it was just an amazing image, this evocative image of uh, a small rhino, small in frame, set in the context of the giant palm jungles of Ujung Kulong um, and it just left me with this feeling I've got to go looking for this near mythical beast um, in this far-flung jungle. Little did I know 21 years later I would be sitting here with a genuine opportunity to do just that um, and so I'm really really excited to to be going ahead and doing it. Um, in terms of the LED Sanford Award, what's so exciting is the award it provides us with an opportunity to combine a genuine passion for amateur photography with conservation of endangered species in this case. Um, in terms of the Javan rhinoceros, photography couldn't be more important. Everything we know about the species so far has come from existing images of the species. Um, and new images are likely to provide us with a whole range of information, which is really exciting. And that could range from nutritional information right down to how far individuals are travelling and range sizes. In addition to to that it will allow us to uh, just raise the media profile of the species um, and hopefully attract some much needed local conservation attention um, so thank you again to everyone and i really look forward to taking you on my journey with me to java in search of the critically endangered javan rhinoceros back to you guys in the studio thank you thank you paul and thank you toby it seems ridiculous that toby and i are both in the same city at the moment but uh, cannot be in the same room the SES Explorer Award for Inspiration and Scientific Trailblazing is supported by the O'Hay Charitable Trust, the Rowan Bentall Charitable Trust, Avocet Insurance Consultants, Pam Coleridge, Egerton Sykes, and the Trustees of the SES. It is designed to support an expedition with that special something. This year's winner is Iris Berger for her Moyen Bathing Lion project. Iris is talking to us from Cornwall in the UK. Can you hear me there? All right, Iris? Yeah. Great. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much, Liv. Um, I'm currently under lockdown in Cornwall, but I would be normally based in Oxford studying for my master's in biodiversity and conservation. So thank you so much, SES, for granting me this award. Um, so I'll be leading three of my immensely dedicated and absolutely incredible course mates to Guinea to look at West African lions. So essentially about six months ago, a local NGO caught a male lion on one of the camera traps. And this was really groundbreaking news because A, um, lions in West Africa are a different subspecies um, and lions in Guinea were actually thought to be regionally extinct. But apart from then one camera trap footage, nothing is really known. Um, so in terms of population size and um, how they actually got there either. So this is where we come in. We will be looking at habitat suitability, long-term population viability, and we're hoping to identify um, wildlife corridors and actually see which areas might be important to lion and other big cat movement in the region. Um, so hopefully the data we will collect will guide management plans of the local NGO as well as of um, national park authorities. So we have identified areas that might be particularly important for lion conservation and they can receive increased protection. Um, we will also collect essentially baseline biodiversity. The region remains very much understudied. So really any relatively basic data. Can we hear, wait, Iris? So much, yes, yes. Um, Sorry, we lost you there, Iris. What? Sorry, we lost Sorry. you there. Could you pick up from the, uh, it's fairly unknown, the area? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Sorry, thanks. Um, so the whole re region really remains very much under-researched um, and really looking forward to getting outside again and leading this expedition. So many thanks to SES and back to you, Liv. Awesome, thank you so much, Iris. 
We have almost reached the end of the 2020 Explorer Awards presentation evening. Thanks to all of you for joining us from around the world, for celebrating the Explorer Award winners, and for sharing this special occasion with them. A very big thank you must go to tonight's sponsors, RSK, who have supported this event for the second year running, and Craig Cohon. Both RSK and Craig were unflinching in their support, despite changing this event from a physical one to a virtual live stream. Thanks to everyone involved in making this event happen, the explorers from around the world and their Explorer Award supporters, the presenters, Reza Pakravan for his tireless work in producing this inspirational event, SES Explorer Awards Manager Nikki Skinner, SES CEO Henrietta Thorpe, and you, the virtual audience. Thank you all so much for sticking with us tonight and bearing with all the tiny technical glitches that we've had to deal with. Um, I've had such a great time hanging out with everyone and I can't wait to see what all of our explorers and supporters end up doing next. Uh, I'm gonna finish up now and hand over to Steve at his house in Buckinghamshire. Okay, bye. Thanks Liv. Uh, it's a strange time, I guess, for anyone involved in adventure. Right now, I'm supposed to be off on an expedition in Russia, attempting a first descent of a whitewater river, and instead I'm sat at home with three babies screaming and wailing, and it's a whole different kind of adventure. But it gives you a chance, I guess, to reflect on what it is we do, what it is that drives us, why we as a species are so driven to find new things and explore new places. And for me, it's been a drive that I've had my whole life. I don't come from grand beginnings, you know, my, my parents are not massively wealthy and they're not explorers. And to me, it seems so disappointing to be brought up in a kind of fairly nameless village in the UK and to see that all of the world's exploration had been done, you know, centuries ago that nobody was ever going to sail out across our oceans and believe that they might sail off the end. Although actually with flat earthers coming back into fashion, now there are plenty of people who think that all over again. Don't get me started on that. But I believed through all my childhood that it, we were living in a time when old fashioned exploration was finished and would never be done again. And it turns out that I was wrong. In my adult life, I've had the extraordinary opportunity of being the first, of, of quantifiably, definitely being the first to set foot on mountain tops and take the first light into cave systems that have never been illuminated in tens of millions of years that make the first ever descents uh, of whitewater rivers. And it turns out that old fashioned exploration is still possible. It just maybe takes a little bit more creativity to, to know where to find these places. So my first ever big expedition on my own was to uh, attempt to walk across uh, New Guinea on my own when I was in my, my late teens, my early 20s. It was an absolute catastrophe uh, from start to finish, a total, total failure. But what I found is that we learn far more from our failures than we do from our successes. And that actually that expedition, which was a disaster from start to finish, taught me more than I've, I've ever learned from the expeditions that have ended in triumph. This last year, though, has been very special for me, and that's the reason why I've been put forward for this award. Over the course of one calendar year, we did 10 expeditions, every single one of which had an element that had never been done before. I had my life just teetering on a thread several times over the course of that year, but I made friendships which are far, far stronger than any family sometimes seem to be. And I have learned more about myself and about our planet than I ever thought possible. The first of those expeditions was probably the most unusual because it was to the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And I'm sure that there are lots of you out there who've been there because it's, it's home to Playa del Carmen and Cancun. And these places where, you know, millions of people go on their holidays. And yet, if you step in land, no more than a few miles, you find a dry forest where very few people ever go. And below that is a lattice work of caves, which are flooded with water, crystal clear water. 
and there are hundreds of miles, literally hundreds of miles of cave passage there that have never been explored before. I was lucky enough to link up with explorers who work there all the time and to be given access to what they believe were likely to be new cave passages and to swim through water that is crystal clear, so clear that it doesn't seem you're swimming at all, it seems more like you're flying, and swim into a room that's like a cathedral decorated with stalagmites and stalactites is, is just the most extraordinary experience and so much more so because it's happening now, today, in this, in this time where it would seem that the only exploration left to be done, or exploring genomes, you know, now there are wondrous places and some of them have incredible artifacts in them. In them. So explorers have been finding in these, these sunken caves bones of long extinct animals, gymnasts, and the, the bones of our ancestors who may have been walking through these passages when they were dry, who may have swum into these passages, who, who for them, they were, they were sacred places. Into cave systems where emblazoned on the walls that have been you know, marked in charcoal, these drawings of jaguars and, and tapir. And thinking that several thousand years ago, my ancestors from the ancient Maya would have wandered into those caves using a blazing torch to, to mark these extraordinary forms on the, on the wall, it just sends a chill up the back of my neck. We were working in, in teams of people who are all the absolute best at what they do. And as anyone who's ever planned an expedition before will know, that is just critical. You, on an expedition, you put your life into other people's hands every second and expect them to do the same with you. And that's why you form such fast friendships so quickly. The second big expedition was to the frozen north, up to the Arctic, a place that's changing faster than anywhere else on the planet, and specifically to, to Greenland and to the world's largest fjord. Our aim was to paddle down this fjord when it had never happened before in the spring, when it should be just completely sealed in with ice thick enough that you can drive a tank across it. Our a summation from looking at all of the science was that because this region is changing so fast, for the first time ever, this fjord was going to be open. There was going to be open water there at this time of year. So we turned up there in the spring and it turned out to be true. There were miles and miles of open sea. And while it offered us an extraordinary opportunity to paddle beneath towering icebergs and in amongst the pack ice and to have polar bears stalk us across Arctic beaches at the same time, there's just that deep unease that this expedition should be possible at all. On the same expedition, we also made the first ascent of an Arctic mountain. It was one of the most dangerous mountains I've ever done. The whole thing just falling apart, crumbling uh, with the, the rock that's been exposed to constant freeze and, and, uh, and thaw over, over millennia. And standing on the summit of that mountain and looking out to the horizon and knowing that there isn't another human being in that landscape as far as the eye can see. And that almost all the mountains that you can see there have never been climbed before. That's a powerful thing. It's a powerful thing for the youngsters who, you know, are, are like I was when I was a kid, who, who are thinking, oh, well, what's the point of me getting into expeditions or adventure or exploration? That's all been done before. Well, it hasn't. There is still so much out there. There are still several generations worth of mountains left in Greenland for people to climb for the first time. The honour of naming that mountain fell to me, and I spoke to the, the, the local elders um, who live several hundred miles away, by the way, and asked if they would give us permission. They said they would. And so we named it Angula Siliac, which means uh, firstborn son, as I was just expecting my first son, Logan, at the time. So it was quite an emotional moment for me, as I'm sure you can imagine. And not long after I got back, Logan was, was born, and it was a, a transformation for me. But I didn't have long to be a dad because the next expedition was heading to uh, the Middle East, to the deserts of Oman. There we found canyons that uh, had never been descended before. It's quite, uh, people ask how, how you know, how you know that a, a canyon is fresh and that no one's been into it before. Well, first of all, you know, people that do expeditions, um, they, they record every uh, every new expedition they do but in these canyons it was crystal clear because you know a lot of them were being used through deep time over thousands of years and you could see the polish on the rocks from people using the canyons uh, 
for the centuries looking for water and there'd be cairns and there'd be you know evidence of people passing through them and then in more recent times you know to descend giant overhanging drops there's no way of doing that without having modern equipment and to do that you'd have to have uh, ropes that would be left in place or bolts that would be left in place and if there's no evidence of of those sorts of things and you're in contact with all of the people that do exploratory canyoning in that part of the world then you know you know that you've got a first and it, it was just an extraordinary experience to drop down into these these bowls in the canyon with towering rock walls either side of you and know that no human being's been there before. It's it's a really strong thought, particularly in, in this day and age. And, and the canyons were stunning, filled with uh, incredibly harshly uh, adapted desert wildlife. You know, at the bottom of one of the, the falls, we found uh, saw scale vipers just there where our ropes fell at the bottom of the canyon. Most of the expeditions that I do are in, in rainforests, and this particular project was, was no uh, exception. So the, probably the, the longest time we spent in the field was in Suriname, which is a country to the north of South America. And it's a really exciting place because the, the population is tiny, just a few hundred thousand people in, in a country that's you know, pretty much the size of England. And all of those people are clustered at, at the coast. So the interior is just empty rainforest. And we did a, a, a lot of research. I've been planning this particular expedition since 1997. And what we did was we were looking at uh, Google Earth, but looking at successive strips of image. So you'd look at parts of the rainforest, you'd zoom in on particular parts of the forest, and not just the current image, but you'd look back at it at different times throughout the year and over different years going back. And occasionally you'd catch a glint of gold in the forest where it shouldn't be. And that's light reflecting off a river, a river that doesn't occur on any map, that doesn't exist. And what we did was we used helicopters to drop in at the sources of those unknown, unmapped rivers and then uh, paddle them down back to where they, they reached known territory. Um, we, were, we were in the rainforest for about six weeks in total. And uh, although we all started to really get on each other's nerves, the experiences were, were just jaw dropping. And the one in particular that I will never, ever forget was we were on one river and we were looking at our GPS and we could tell that we still had uh, 100 metres of descent to make before we came back to the main river. But the main river was was no more than five or six miles away. Um, so somewhere we had to lose a whole bunch of, of altitude and we were thinking, oh, this is going to be terrible. We're going to hit miles and miles of rapids and it's going to be hell. We have to carry the boats and all the kit. But instead what happened was we paddled around a corner and the river just dropped away into a waterfall, a giant waterfall, nearly 100 metres high, uh, threading off through the forest to either side. Uh, totally unknown, unnamed, unmapped. The, local, the nearest local villages were five or six days away. They had no idea that the, this waterfall even existed. We went back through all of the records from previous exploration and there was no record of the waterfall. And if I could bottle the mood in camp that night, it, it, the, the excitement, seeing a bunch of hardcore, ho hard-nosed adventurers all bursting with just the joy of what they'd seen for the first time, it was magic, just pure magic. I can remember lying in the river that night and watching the, the stars and the clouds moving across the moon and thinking that, that this was why I got into expeditions in the first place for moments like this. Um, I can't, I haven't got time, unfortunately, to tell you about all the other expeditions. That, you know, I, I, my, my time's short, but what I want to say is, is to any of the young people out there who are watching this, there is nothing that will make you feel more alive. There is nothing that will form faster friendships. There is nothing that will give you more of a sense of purpose than adventure. And they don't have parts of the world. You know, adventure starts at home and you have to learn your skills somewhere. So learn it with the, the Scouts, or with the Duke of Edinburgh. But please go on an adventure. It, it, will, it will change your life. It will change your focus. And particularly if you're if you're searching for some kind of meaning, that's just the best way of finding it. And I, I think if I have one message, it's that there is still so much left out there to do. And by doing it, you'll learn to love our planet and by learning to ways of protecting it and taking care of it.
So a huge, huge thank you to uh, to everyone at SES for this enormous honour. You know, I'm I'm completely overwhelmed. I'm completely blown away by it. Um, and thank you for staying on to the end to listen to me talking, you all. Uh, I really hope that you think it was worth the wait. I hope you've enjoyed the evening's proceedings and hearing from the uh, the Explorer Award and Honorary Award winners. And you can follow everyone's process, progress via the SES website and social media channels. And if you like what SES does, and why not, why not consider becoming a member? So you can easily join up via the website at uh, ses-explore.org. Thank you all again and stay safe.